there's a lot of, there's a lot of precedence in black lyrics from jarring emotional juxtapositions in the blues particularly also in Smokey Robinson's deliberate paradoxes but the nearest emotional equivalent isn't in black music it's in punk early stones kings velvets stooges dolls where a song will be will seem to be one thing then then be another the ranting the ranting part of love rap could be Lou Reed in one of his bad moods except that unlike a jagger or a reed Spoonie hasn't calculated may not even be aware of his juxtapositions which adds to its power the feelings have great impact because they come from an unexpected source if Spoonie were a wearing punk or rock his alienation and rage will feel an expectation of the genre in disco they seem truer Spoonie Gee has made some great records and an equal number of mediocre ones I think he's a genius but I don't think he knows what he's doing He is drawn to a vision of the world as a fake and tre treacherous, treacherous place. Maybe something, uh, something's bugging him. Maybe uncontinuously he feels that if not only the world that's fake or women that are fake, it's himself. Spoon is not, not one of us. He has nothing He has nothing to do with punk culture or post punk culture. I don't know if I could carry on an interesting conversation with him if we could find any cultural or moral common ground. But there is a common ground that's part of the intellect called the emotions where I do my deepest analysis of life. However much I admire current heroes like Mark E. Smith and Ian McKay, people I identify with, I know they don't make music as strong as this. Listening to Spoonie I la is like hearing my own feelings and I have to confront my own fears. This means maybe that I'm not really unlike him, maybe I'm not... I'm more like him that I'm that I'm like you. I've quoted this at length because this is how the piece works at criticism. In the steady move from description to emotion to identity to identity via questions of voice and genre, genre, text and performance, knowledge, true and feeling, all there are here focused on one artist. On, on a couple of, of, tracks, of tracks. Now compare high criticism, Gregory Shando, Sando or Milton Babbitt. Like any Babbitt piece, Dual is a labyrinth of closely packed information. Every detail means something or which or which to me is we is the hour and almost the horror if it could mean something. The the F sharp, E flat and B natural isolated in the highest register of the piano in the first two measures return in mix in measure six and first three notes of a melodic phrase. Accompanied by the B flat, G natural, and C natural, that were the next notes heard in the highest register at the end of, of major two and the start of major three. And these are just the most obvious connections that could be made between two parts of the piece chosen almost as, as at random. 
Rabbi likes to say that moments in his music can be memories of what came before and presentiments of what is to come. Serial technique pre procedures, ever new associations of, fam of familiar elements, giving everything that happens the power of, uh, of an omen. Following a babbit piece in, in close details is like reading in trails or tea, or tea leaves. Every re rearrangement in every bar might mean something. So many rearrangements are possible that you never know what the omens really mean. New developments seem, if not arbitrary, then at least willful. This is a sort of higher order zaniness, something unpredictable and even wild that transcends Babbitt's logic and finds its way and finds its way into something I haven't mentioned it yet, which I will call Babbitt's mode of musical speech. For in the end, I do find Babbitt eccentric. He is a superb musical craftsman, and I think an authentically great composer. Doubt in some ways hard to take, but he is also zany, wild, and I saw this again with admiration more than a little bit mad. His music and the whole school of he represents are products of, of the 50s. As much the symptoms of the eruption of tumultuous subterranean forces into above ground life as monsters movies, as most monster movies, rock and roll, the beat generation, and abstract expressionism. But in Babbitt's case, the eruption is controlled, disguised, and unmentioned. The secret nobody will acknowledge or even name. In a videotape interview with Anne Svartz or Baru College, Abit, Babbitt calls himself a man of university whose music reflects the life of the academy in the best sense of the world. That's partly true, of course, but there's much more there. There's no point in thinking that Babbitt should do or think anything but what he does. But I can't help thinking that he sold himself short by trying both to extend the boundaries of his art and to remain ad academically respectable and, be, and by acknowledging only the ver verifiable and therefore trivial aspects of his amazing work. If like Joyce, Jackson Pollock or John Cage, so passionate a man had chosen to define himself as an artist and not as an academic that might he have achieved. The descriptive terms here are different, the language of notational rather than lyrical analysis. The general distinction draws attention to a different context, the academy rather than the market, but the overall shape of the review is the same. The move from describing the music to describing the listener's response to the music to, consider, to considering the relationship of feeling, truth and identity, and Kogan's and Shadow's judgments are in fact much the same. Both Spoonie Gee and Milton Babbitt show flowered genius. In both cases, the critics seem to know better than the artists what they are, what they are or should be doing. What links these responses in the other works in the, is the assumption that music, the experience of music for composer, performer and listener alike, give us a way of being in the world, a way of making sense of it. And if both critics begin Uh, by stressing their distance from the musicians, both Spoonie and Milton Babbitt are set up as the decidedly odd. Both critics also end up in a sort of collusion with them. Musical appreciation is, 
by its very nature a process of musical identification and the aesthetic response is implicitly an ethical agreement. Postmodernism, uh, per, postmodernism and, perfor and performance. The blurring of high-low cultural boundary here between critics is of course a sign of the postmodern and in bringing Kogan and Shando and Sando together I, I need to distinguish my position from the from the one usually adopted. The confusion of the high and low is conventionally indicated by quote quotation or appreciation across the divide, the pop recycling of classical music and the art reuse of pop are taken to mark an underlying shift to of aesthetic sensibility. In practice, as Andrew Godi Godwin has pointed out, such arguments mostly concern our relationship between the artistic avant-garde and certain pop forms. Pop art remains the model. The most seated postmodern musicians are people such as Laurie Anderson, David Birne, and Brian Eno who are clearly artists rather than pop arts. The institutional boundary between high and mass art seems intact. There remains a clear difference between Philip Glass, Philip Glass and, and a Madonna in terms of packaging, marketing, performance space, recording sound, and so forth. Judges just as we can continue to distinguish between the pop Eno producer of U2 and James and the art Eno producer of ambient video, the freedom of blurring the art mass boundary depends on the boundary still being clearly drawn. And if we go back to 18th, 18th, 18th century debates about musical meaning, and to the origins of the romantic view of art that underpins high cultural arguments, the view which was duly appropriated by would-be artist rock musicians in the 60s, it becomes apparent that the high-low distinction doesn't really concern the nature of the art object or how it is, it is produced, but refers to different mo modes of perception. The crucial high-low distinction is that between contemplation and wallowing, between intellectual and sensual appreciation, between hard and easy listening, which is why a comparison of high and low critics becomes in interesting. To add low cultural goods to lists of art objects available for intellectual or serious appreciation, which was postmodern theorists tend to do, is not then to get rid of the traditional boundaries between the high end and the low. And the much more interesting issue is whether we can really continue to sustain the implicit separation of emotion and feeling, sense and sensuality body and mind. This is the issue raised, for example, by the ambient house music of, of groups like Future Sound of London and the Affex, Affex Twin, music which draws, draws simultaneously on rave culture and minimalism. The question, in fact, is whether musical experience has ever, has ever really been mapped by hi, the high-low mind-body distinction. The 19th century dialogues of absolute music may, may have worked hard to make musical appreciation a purely mental experience, but this was hard work precisely because most listeners, listeners didn't, didn't listen to music this way, however much they wanted to. Even high, even high music making and listening remained a physical as well as a spiritual activity, a sensual as well as a cognitive experience. To enjoy music of all sorts is to feel it. At the same time, musical pleasure is never just a matter of feeling, it is also a matter of judgment. 
Check the postmodern reading of contemporary pop in terms of pastiche. Digital technology has certainly speeded up the process in which composition means quotation, but what we need to consider here are not much the specific texts that result as, that, as the way our attention is drawn to the performance of quotation. On rap tracks, for instance, far from musical authority being dissipated into fragments and secondhand sounds, it is enhanced by the attention drawn to the, qu qu to the quoting itself, the quoting act itself. As Paul Gilroy suggests, the aesthetics rules that govern that govern that govern it are premised on a dialect of re rescuing appropriation and recombination that creates special pleasures. Pleasure in which aesthetic stress is lay, laid upon the sheer social and cultural distance that formerly separated the diverse elements now dislocated into novel meanings by their provocative aural juxtaposition and in which the continuing importance of performance is em emphasized by tracks radically unfinished forms. Hip hop, in other words, with its cut ups, cut ups, its scratches, breaks and samples, it's, it's best understood as producing not new, not new texts, but new ways of performing texts. New, new ways of performing the making of meaning. The pleasure of montage comes from the act of juxtaposition rather than from the labor of interpretation. And for the listener and dancer too, the fun lies in the process, not the result. Not for nothing is, is rap a voice-based form with an exceptionally strong sense of presence. Uh, the aesthetic questions about questions about this postmodern music at least concern concerns concerns not meanings and their interpretation identity translated into discursive forms which have to be de decoded but but mutual en enactment identity produced in performance Space, time, and stories. It is conventional nowadays, in the academy at least, to divide the arts into, a, into separate categories, such that the performing arts, theater, dance, and music are differentiated from the fine arts, literature, painting, sculpture, and on the whole, the performing arts are taken to be inferior to the fine arts. Incapable of providing such rich aesthetic experience or social commentary. This is a, a relatively recent hierarchy, uh, an effect of 19th century conventions. The impact of Romanticism, the simultaneous emphasis, emphasis on art as individual expression and as a private property. High art was thus institu institutionalized by the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie as a transcendent a social experience in the contemplative bank-like bank setting of the gallery and concert hall, the museum and the library. In the 18th century, with its, with its concerns for rhetoric and oratory, the distinction between the performing and the fine arts was not so clear and there were, there were ways in which the performer, the former, were clearly superior to the latter. One way of thinking about the contrast here is to see the fine arts as being organized around the use of space and the performing arts as organized around the use of time. In special arts, value is embodied in an object. 
uh, text, the, ana the analytic emphasis is on structure. Uh, the tested objective reading is, is possible and artistic reading can be extricated from the work's formal qualities. In temporal arts, the value of work is experienced as something momentary and the analytical emphasis is on process. Subjective reading is necessary and reading talking and reading talking account and reading taking account of one's own immediate response and the work's artistic meaning lies in that response, the work's rhetorical qualities.